Sophomore year in high school is when it started. That would be 2003, I believe. His name was Michael D., but he was called Blueberry by our circle of friends. I have long forgotten the story behind the moniker, but I imagine that it was selected mostly to distinguish from the many other Michaels around. He was a tall, gawky, acne-afflicted junior who had a hands-in-his-pocket angry walk, a deep dimple in the middle of his chin, and an absolutely unintelligible manner of speaking. Unintelligible to the point where his second nickname was Michael Mumble. I don't remember anything particular about that meeting, really. Just a few passing words, a mutual friend stepping in to wave an introductory hand back and forth, while repeating our names to the other in quick bursts, like a sneeze on a rifle. Gracie, Michael, but we call him Blueberry. Blueberry Mike, Gracie. I was a spunky 15-year-old discovering a whole new diverse world out there, and in retrospect, I see how my giddy naivete left a door wide open for Blueberry to step through. He would talk, well, more like mumble to me before first period. I struggled to understand what was said behind his tight lips that hardly moved, so our interactions were usually brief and consisted mostly of me smiling brightly and nodding along before politely excusing myself. I often picked up on his awkward anger and aggression, stuffed so deep and snug inside his six foot three frame. All teenagers are angry. Hell, even spunky me had my moody sprees, but Blueberry's anger was different. It was a warped, twisted, stubborn, narcissistic, permeating, calm kind of anger. I remember thinking to myself that it just burned the air around him. Being 15, I had no car, so I took my lunches at the subway that sat two blocks away from school. Sometimes I went with friends, but more often I went by myself. I liked the quiet and chance to regroup from school's chaos. He appeared one day, mumbling away across from me in a booth while I pasted on a slightly puzzled smile, lips tight over my mouth full of food, wondering what on earth he was saying. Then the letters came. My best friend, Christy, and I wrote tomes of notes during our class periods to fold up into neat squares and swap with each other in the halls. This was how we plotted and schemed before the advent of text messaging. We had designated hallways where we would hand off our paper squares, one of these hallways was where I would also see Blueberry. One day, I just slyly palmed Christie's note in my hand when I suddenly felt a tap on my shoulder and paper slid into my other hand. It was Blueberry, staring fixedly at me with a slight smile. With a surprised chuckle and nod of acknowledgement, I took Blueberry's note into my purse along with Christie's. I soon found out that not only was he Michael Mumble, he was Michael Muddled. While his handwriting was neat and printed, and I was far from illiterate, I could not make head or tail out of his train of thought. He wrote as he spoke, in a mashed, inverted manner, where the subject matter was vague at best. All I could make out of the letters he would give me from that day on was that I was part of the subject matter. Something about my considerations or me not seeing. Filling up the paper margins were badly drawn frogs, babblings about druids, and more frogs. I got these letters often, usually daily. I probably wrote a short note back to him once, maybe twice at most, but they came steadily as ever. As spring wound down, I began to get more than uneasy around him. To the group, Blueberry was Blueberry, just a normal oddball in the background. I began to avoid him, but he seemed blind to that. In retrospect, at the age of 25, I can safely say people pick up when you're avoiding them, but not Blueberry. The lunchtime interceptions and notes continued when he could manage it. And then came the gifts. I was a writer back then. I always had notebooks that I constantly filled up with any scribblings that came into my head. I wrote in the cheap, smaller-sized spirals that you can pick up at any drugstore. I knew better than to buy nice, fancy ones. They'd last me a week at best, but it was a fancy, heavy-bound journal that Blueberry gave me one day in the hallway after school. 
I didn't know what to say. It was an odd gift from someone whom I barely knew. There was something tainted about the journal. It was beautiful. A plush notebook etched with the design of an ancient map of China. And I swear the covers were of suede. It was expensive and chanting. And it gave me the chills. The first ten pages consisted of yet another letter he had penned to me. The first several paragraphs talked of how I was the only one who understood him, and he loved me. I stopped at that point. I could never bring myself to write in it or throw it away. Instead, I tucked it in a keepsafe box that slept underneath my bed, along with all the other notes and trinkets. I told myself I was giving off the wrong signals. I told myself I was being silly and overreacting to someone who was perfectly nice. Christy told me, you're lucky that someone buys you something nice without even trying to sleep with you. Friends told me, ah, Blueberry's just a goof, but he's alright. I was grateful when the summer rolled around. Junior Year When school started back up, I had a boyfriend named Adam, brightly dyed red hair and a red car, so Blueberry inevitably faded into the background, whether he liked it or not. He had no driver's license, eschewed the alternative of a bicycle, and walked everywhere. Looking back, I realized that this made it harder for him to intercept me at lunch. When I zipped off to meet my older boyfriend at home for the hour-long break, the only times I would see Blueberry was when I was pulling out of the parking lot, and I would see him doing his brisk, frustration-fueled strides in whatever direction. His eyes were always either angrily fixed at a point in the distance and his chin set in a tight line of frustration, or seemed to be searching the area of high school students flooding the parking lot. Every now and then, he would spy my cherry red Volvo station wagon, which was embarrassingly hard to miss, and he would stare. As a side note, I used to dye my hair red. I loved it. Then I read what he put in the first four pages of the second journal he left on my windshield at school. I didn't dye my hair red again until I was 22. For the most part, humans can get a decent read on others. This wasn't the case with Blueberry. I could make neither head or tails of him and his behavior around me, and eventually my teenaged hormones finally said, fuck it. And by fuck it, I mean, I made no more efforts. I decided the best way to fix the situation was to not give a shit. If he talked to me, I would respond with short sentences, then bluntly turn and walk away. I didn't avoid him, neither did I approach him or wave at him in the hallways like I had the year before. He was just another guy in the background. Let me add that in the meantime, the letters never stopped. The gifts came almost like clockwork. A journal left on my car with the first four pages scribbled with the words that I never bothered to read. A bouquet of daisies or roses given to me in the hallway that I promptly gave to a lonely-looking freshman as I turned the next corner. A book of fairy tales on my birthday, also with inscriptions inside. The journals, books, and letters were hardly ever actually read nor used, and all found a home in that keepsake box underneath my bed. I could never explain why I felt compelled to tuck them into the keepsake box, but I just did. At times I would feel guilt, and I would look for anything that I was doing to lead this insane boy on. What on earth compelled him to buy things for a girl that just didn't care? But in the end, my teenage psyche always lost interest, and went back to scheming over how I was going to work around curfew and catch that wicked show happening at the local music venue on a school night. My junior year of high school wound down much like this. When school let out for summer, I was just happy to be able to be with friends and not worry about Blueberry. I came home one afternoon and sauntered into the kitchen to grab a snack. My father had just come home from work, barely beating me by five minutes, as I could tell by how he had already taken off his suit jacket and brought in the mail. He was leaning against the kitchen counter and plucking the bills from my mother's overflow of catalogs when I came up to peck him on the cheek and offer one of the two apples I'd retrieved. Hey there, hun, he mumbled, taking the apple. Whoa, hold up, kid. You've got mail. 
Lucky you. He flipped a rectangular manila envelope towards me and I took it. Who's sending me snail mail? I think to myself, popping open the sealed flap. Maybe it's grandma. Oh, does it feel like a check in here? I start to hum a Smith song as I pry open the brats that anchor the flaps. Girlfriend in coma. I pull the letter out. It's a single page of lined notebook paper. I shake the page. My eyes focus on the first line. I don't really want. Shit. I know that handwriting. Blueberry. I remember yelping in surprise and dropping the letters as if it had burned me. I remember grabbing the envelope and flipping it over to where the address should be, but I don't know why. I already knew it wouldn't make me feel better to see the street numbers I called home, along with my name carefully printed in the center. It did make me feel better, however, to see that a city in Colorado was listed in the top left's return address. Blueberry had left Texas, or so I hoped, because it sure made me sick to see that there was no postage stamp. He had to have hand-delivered it to my home, which he had somehow tracked down. The letter frightened me, in both its contents as well as the fact Blueberry had found out where I lived. I grilled all of our mutual friends, and they all swore that they hadn't been the ones to give out the information. In the letter itself, he sounded almost angry with me, or upset that I hadn't made good on some sort of agreement. Who knows? Thankfully, that was the last I heard of Blueberry. For several years, anyway. Fast forward to spring 2008, where I was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but preparing to move back to my hometown to kick a nasty drug habit and get a fresh start on life. I'd taken a break from packing up my apartment and headed to the library to clear my head and check my space. Ah, 2008. There was a friend request waiting for me when I logged in. Yeah, the cliché reappearance that the protagonist soon ruse. It was Blueberry. Still, to this day, I have no idea what possessed me to accept the request, but I did. Immediately I got a message from him. It was quite civilized actually. He asked how I was doing and even offered an apology for his behavior in high school. I was pleasantly surprised and appreciated the gesture and sent him a response saying so, along with a brief synopsis of my plans on moving back home. By the time I clicked send, my allotted time on the computer was up, so I logged out and headed back to my place to prepare for the move back home the next day. Three days and one state later, I was back home and finally feeling human as the bumps and bruises of the move subsided. It had been a busy few days, and I gladly sat down in front of my father's laptop to check my email and social media. I logged into MySpace and began to work through the stack of accumulated messages. I opened the reply from Blueberry. It had been sent almost immediately after I'd sent my replies several days ago. Well, that's a coincidence. Blueberry was moving back to our hometown as well. Godspeed to him in all of his endeavors was all I thought of it. I didn't think I would be running into him often, as our old group of friends had long since disbanded to get married, move away, or get locked up. I just picked up a job waiting tables at a 24-hour diner chain, Denny's, and enrolled in a summer college course. Life went on, but not for that long. I had just started the swing shift at work, and I was at the counter, filling up salt and pepper shakers, and setting up the floor before the dinner rush hit, when he walked in. I knew who he was while he was still in my peripheral. He slid into the swivel chair and mumbled what I can only imagine was a hello. Then he put his right hand on mine, which was wrapped around the salt tumbler I'd been refilling. Terror and confusion paint my insides. Another spike in blood pressure as he squeezes down hard, if only for a second before releasing his grip. He stares and he mumbles. I just want to quickly pause for a second. This is the part of the story that I find myself taking the longest time to write because I keep exiting my word program and distracting myself with unimportant busy work to avoid writing about what comes next. You see, 
This is the part where I left the door wide open for him to step in and catch me off guard. I could have prevented all of this had I just done something different. It's something I'm still angry with myself over. It's never easy to talk about, so I'm probably going to skip out on a lot of details and deliver the bare bones. I've dragged my heels through this story to this point, so use all the details you know about me and Blueberry that I've given so far to put together the big picture. This is going to be the first time I've ever told this story in its entirety, much less the final chapter. I may or may not be able to finish. And now I'll get back to the story. I should have told him to fuck off that day. I should have listened to my gut, which was screaming profanities at my rationalizing everything away brain. I knew that he moved from Colorado back down to our hometown because I was there. I knew that he'd taken my reply on MySpace as a sign of declaring my undying love to him and his twisted mind. I knew deep down that he was the same scary fuck that found out where I lived in high school. But a part of me had truly thought we'd matured past that point and all that wishful thinking. Instead, I smiled politely, nodded, and excused myself to do anything but be around him. I ended up in the bathroom dry heaving. Anxiety's a bitch. I was stuck. I was the only waitress on the floor until seven a good three hours away, and I had a credit card payment due in three days. I couldn't leave the floor. I remember talking to myself like a crazy person. He'd only said one word. I was being ridiculous. Nobody is twisted enough to do that over a girl that's barely spoken to him or returned any affections. Ludicrous. And who knows what he actually said back there or what he meant by touching my hand. He could just be surprised to see me, so who's really the crazy person here? It must be me. But then why had he looked at me as if he was gloating, as if he was hungry? I dry heaved to the porcelain gods again, dart off to the floor, stay busy, stay away from the counter, and especially stay away from Blueberry. Unbeknownst to me, while I went about avoiding him, Blueberry applied for a position as a dishwasher. He was hired on the spot. I found out the next day as I clocked in and saw him carefully studying the employee schedule. I should have said something then, but I didn't. I was afraid. I didn't have time to think either. I managed to somehow change clothes, tie my apron, dry heave yet again from anxiety several times before my shaking legs found their way onto the floor. Like I said before, so much of it is a blur. I'm typing this as fast as I can to get to the end of this nightmare story. I don't remember many specific incidents leading up towards the end. I remember Friday night bar rush when he yelled at a 65-year-old man, a regular of mine that I'd come to think of as grandpa because he thought he was looking at me with pervert eyes. I remember how many times he tried to stop me while I was neck deep in the weeds with drunk and hungry customers, catching my arm to make me stop and look at him. The last time he grabbed me so hard, a bruise bloomed in place of his fingers the next morning. I remember the look of pure hatred and frustration that he gave every one of my male customers, and I remember how he said he would slit them from ear to ear if they ever touched me. I remember when my shift ended, and I held all of it in until I made it to the walk-in freezer. I just let out half a sob when the freezer door swung open, and Blueberry had himself in front of me. I remember the metallic taste of fear as I looked up at him. What next? He was looking forward to the talk we would have after work, he said. Oh, the talk about us. Oh, God, no. I remember wanting to scrub my forehead with lye from where he bent down and kissed me before exiting the walk-in. He made me sick being so close to me. Dirty. I remember the desperate need to leave. I clock out, knowing that he won't be off until hours after I am. I can escape. I pull out of the parking lot and stop at a red light two blocks down. Find a friend to stay with. Figure all this out. God, I need my job, I think to myself. 
The passenger door opens. Fuck. It's him. When the hell did my passenger door not lock? Fuck. Did he? He broke my lock. He's in my car. I'm numb. He acts like this is a normal thing for us to do. My logic freezes. He gives me directions to his house, telling me how happy he is that I came around after all of these years of denying that what was between us was real. I can't breathe. A part of me is giving up. A part of me is so mad at myself for being so weak and unable to stop all of this. Wait, I'm not completely numb. There's still some anger in me. I'm starting to get angry at this person who repeatedly refused to take no for an answer, who intentionally came back to our town with the narcissistic, presumptuous intent of claiming me now that I had supposedly come around. He came into my job and made sure to move in fast, hard, and aggressively because he knew this is what I would do. The only words I'd ever heard him speak clearly and without any mumbles was a threat to slit my customer's throat from ear to ear. He walked out of his first night on the job just to follow me and got into my car as I was at a stoplight. Fuck that. As I had the opportunity to sit and process the absurdity of the situation, I became temporarily lost in a fugue state of memory, realization, and gritty resolve. We reached his place and I snapped back to reality. Immediately, I saw that the front lawn was teeming with drunken partygoers. His roommate had thrown a keg party that drew enough people to fill a high school stadium. To this day, I consider this the only reason I felt brave enough to do what I did next. There were too many people around to see and hear things. I knew it, and he knew it, and he didn't seem happy with it. I followed him into the house. I let him take me to his room. I stood in the open doorway and balked as he tugged on my wrist to pull me into the room for God knows what reason, and it was like another person was speaking through me. Stay the hell away from me. I have never and will never be interested in you as a friend or anything else. You know what the hell you've been trying to do, and you've been trying to do it since I was 15. Don't come near me again. You need professional help, you son of a bitch. Then I realized how quiet it was. I swear to God, Everyone in that party stopped and stared at us. It was so quiet, and all the blood in my body was pumping in a war dance of fear disguised as rage. I saw him falter, and we locked eyes. I could tell he was grasping, and then I tried to pull away. He was strong. Then he screamed. God, I'll never forget how angry he looked. He wasn't mumbling. He screamed so clearly. Just fucking lay with me tonight. Why won't you just lay down on the bed, you stew? He lurched forward like a tension-bearing spring to drag me into his room. It was at this point the bodies flew at him. Several of them. They tackled Blueberry to the floor. Beer was flying everywhere. The froth was landing in my hair. My shirt was wet with a faint scent of fresh hops. They were screaming, hands on hands girl hands, nails digging into Blueberry's iron fingers. I could feel my blood slowing at the pockets where he had me firmly. My arms must be blue, I thought to myself before I saw the girls. Three of them, blonde and red. Run, come on, get away from him, they yell. His fingers are slipping claws, but the long solar nails of three women are too much. He flinches with a jerk that forces him to let go. He disappeared under the heaps of bodies. My legs worked again. I ran to my car. I ran the fuck away. I still don't know who the men who tackled him were. Neither do I know the names of the women who scratched their own nails into Blueberry's skin so that he would let go and they could flank me in protection as I ran to my car. Still to this day, I don't think I've ever been faced with a truer definition of solidarity than the act right there. They didn't even know who I was when they all dove in. 
I don't know what kind of spiritual force is out there roaming the purple evenings with those who are alone, but more nights than not, I say a little thank you to the skies, hoping at least one of them hear me. I owe those strangers a great deal. Now that I've said that, the thing of this part of the story is, it's not over. It hasn't gotten bad yet, not by a long stretch. The final part was the hardest to write, and I still get sick to my stomach thinking about it at times. At this point, I wish I could say it's over. It's not. Stalkers are persistent. They don't think like you and I do. What I had done the night I told Blueberry no was something good and bad. Good in that I had acted loudly enough to become a person to him, not an object bad in the sense that I'd set down boundaries that conflicted with his intents, and I had done it in a crowd of people, embarrassing him. I knew that where he had just seen me as a living doll before, he would now see me as someone to be punished. This is what I thought to myself as I stared at the ceiling. I barely slept after crashing through my front door and quickly, desperately checking each window and door's lock in my father's house before collapsing in a heap by the bed. My father wasn't home, as he usually stayed over at his new girlfriend's place. I didn't mind, it was nice to see him in love. It took years off of his face, and I didn't want to put those years back on with my predicament. I didn't want to see the look in his eyes if he saw the branches of broken blood vessel blossoms that ran up my arm in dull spirals of pain. I didn't want to see him and Blueberry in the same room. I didn't want him to feel disappointed or upset with me. I'd kicked the habit and worked diligently on my decision-making skills, but my helplessness in dealing with Blueberry seemed to me a return to a life I thought I'd left behind. No, better to figure this out myself. He'd spent enough sleepless nights worrying about me. I was suddenly thankful for my parents' recent divorce. My mother stayed behind in the house I grew up in, and my father had rented out a lovely house in an adjacent neighborhood. Blueberry couldn't possibly find me here. With that comforting thought, I pulled myself out of the bed and dressed. I remember picking a shirt with sleeves to cover the bruises he'd left. I didn't even care that it was easily a hundred degrees outside. Anything to keep me from seeing and remembering his brand on me. I padded towards the kitchen stopping at the large glass window panes that faced the open schoolyard across the street. I pulled back the blinds and took in the grassy, sun-drenched view. I liked the house. It was open. I could see anybody coming, but it was quiet for now. In the kitchen, I stepped into the cupboard and plucked a fresh bag of chips. I was starving. I had just started to pull open the bag of chips when the banging started. Boom, boom, boom. They were a parody of polite knocks. I had no idea how he had found me. Still to this day, I still don't. But it doesn't matter how, just that he did. But I knew who was behind the door. Just as that person knew that I was hiding in there somewhere. At the very first echo of Blueberry's fist hitting the front door, my legs turned to dust beneath me. The bag of chips burst as I collided with linoleum. My body's momentum transforms the potato shards into a million traders echoing every move. I was sobbing silently. Hiding behind the fridge and watching the shadow slide along the floor to where I'd just been seconds ago. Gazing out the window with that false sense of safety. Boom, boom, boom again. Then there was silence. My phone buzzed on the counter. I stretched my arm upward and clutched that little electric beacon of freedom. A text from 303 area code, Colorado. Him. The text illuminates the screen. My dear, I know you're in there. Let me in. I have your favorite Subway sandwich for you. And a surprise. Jesus, how did he get my number? My sleeve had been pushed back from the reach for my phone. I see the bruises again. 
and a friendly reminder from Blueberry. Some of them are in the same shade as his name. The knocks have been quiet, and there is no more shadow on the wooden floor by the window. I remember that there was a click in my brain at that moment. Something finally connected. My survival instincts are finally triggered, and I shift from frozen into overdrive. I am no longer human. I am a gazelle running from the lion. Chips crunch under my shoes as I snap up to my feet, keys and phone in hand, and I run for the sake of everything I love in this world. I hear metal creak behind me back in the kitchen just as I slam the front door open. All that sunlight outside charges every cell in my bruised body, and from the front steps, I dive into my car from through the open passenger side window. I leave a perfect arc of rubber marks on the driveway as I reverse, swivel my head and scan the yard for him. There is nowhere to hide in this wide open neighborhood. Nothing. He is unseen. The gas pedal is one with the floorboard. I'm thankful the students of the elementary school across the street are not out for recess because I would braid them into the sticky tarmac without a second thought if they'd stood between me and safety. That is the level of my fear. I keep driving, blowing through all yields and stops. I wonder if I'm crazy. My phone buzzes with another text from that Colorado number. No, not crazy. Scared. Not of death. Not yet, anyway. I'm scared of what he'll do to make me return to his normalcy. I am a doll to him. What happens when dolls start to speak? When they run like a gazelle away from his playroom rules? What happens if the lion catches the gazelle? I dry heave and sob at once. Oh god, the fear. I feel like he's with me right now, watching. It does occur to me to call the police, but what do I tell them? They would look at me like I was crazy just like everyone else had assured me that Blueberry was fine. Just odd. So very odd. Maybe I still am the crazy one. I'm going 55 in a 25 after all, but I know that I can't be alone at this moment. I pick up my phone, dial the number for Brandon. He lives the closest. I have to redial twice. Blueberry keeps texting, and the alerts make me exit my keypad. His messages tell me about the lack of appreciation for the things he does for me. I dry heave again. I'm still going 55. Finally, I'm able to input all seven digits. Hello? Brandon's voice is an angelic sound. I cry. All that comes out is the name of the street I'm on. He directs me to park a block away from where I am. I see him. He sees me. I leave the keys in the ignition, but turn the car off. I run across the green field to him. I feel like I can't do anything but run for dear life. Brandon catches me, holds me tightly by the arms with two big hands. My bruises hurt under his palms. My lungs are on fire. I can't stop my legs from twitching. I babble. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. He found me. Please don't tell him where I am, Brandon. Please. I collapse on the soft grass. Brandon tells me later on that he pieced the story together from what he could hear me say, curled up in a fetal position on the grass, babbling about blueberries, bruises, and being an object. He wasn't sure what to make of it, and admits that he thought I was back on the shit and was having a bad come down. Then he goes to retrieve the keys to my car from the ignition. My phone is on the front seat, still lighting up incessantly with messages from a 303 number. Brandon sees this. He opens my phone and reads several of the 52 messages sent in the last half hour. He said he couldn't bear to read anymore after seeing the one that included a photo of my open underwear drawer. It dawned on Brandon that Blueberry is inside my home and enjoys letting me know. Brandon hugs me and talks to me until Carly and Kate get to the park. Carly and Kate will take me to their house, where we will call the police. Brandon has warrants so he can't be there with us, 
But before he leaves, he hugs me so fiercely and reminds me that I'm real and not plastic. He whispers into Carly's ear and advises her to check the messages on my phone if she doesn't believe. She makes it to the messages where he tells me that he will shave my red harlot's hair off if I don't come back and be good. My phone rings. Carly answers. It's my father. Kate drives my car home. They stay as I hear what's happened. The next door neighbor had been in her kitchen when she saw me run out of the door and peel out of the driveway. The clue, she said, was how I'd thrown myself into the car through the window, as if I couldn't waste a minute without opening a door. She went closer to her window to watch the scene. As my car faded away, she looked at the front door of the house. She saw a tall, thin man coming out of the front door and staring into the direction I'd gone. She said he looked angry and I looked terrified. She called the police. My father, unaware of all of this, came home soon after the neighbor placed the call. Blueberry was back outside on the porch by then, perched on the step, watching and waiting. My father stared at the strange boy on his steps. He saw the tire tracks and absence of my car. Blueberry calmly looked up at my father, met his gaze, and blankly said that he was thinking about getting me a vanity for my birthday. My father tells me that Blueberry stood up and placed himself between my dad and the door. My father was a criminal defense attorney for 30 years. He's a stoic, tough man who's defended countless killers, thieves, addicts, people who have sexually assaulted, and the truly innocent before a jury of peers. Not much shakes him, yet the tremor in my father's voice is perceptible as he tells me this. He stares Blueberry down and simply says, Do you pay for this house, boy? I don't answer to you. Get out of my way. Blueberry moves. My father goes inside, disturbed by the boy on the stairs and glad that I'm not here. In the kitchen, he sees the crushed bag of chips on the floor, the mess in the kitchen. He can see the signs of frantic movement etched in the carpet of chips. He can see that the back door is wide open. I would never leave it like that. He also remembers that the front door had been unlocked. He and I share a paranoia of unlocked doors. And it was then that my father knew something was very wrong. He feels sick. He sprints to the front door. Hey, kid, he roars at Blueberry's retreating back. He'd taken off down the street when he heard the sirens. The police cars called by the neighbor pull up at this point. One patrol goes in pursuit of Blueberry. The other stays to talk to my father, who is calling my phone, and our astute neighbor, who relates what she'd seen through the window. The police ask if I know this man who was on the stairs. Carly gives him my phone as an answer. My father sees over the cop's shoulder, turns pale, and closes his eyes. I see the years go back on his face. I can't stop crying. I can't get a word out. All I can do is lead them all to my bedroom, where Carly holds up the bed skirt as I reach underneath and pull out the three keepsake boxes that I have filled with the last five years' worth of Blueberry's gifts and letters. Carly brings me a yearbook. I cry harder and harder as I open up the page with his class photo on it and point at his full name. I'm crying this hard because it's over. I'm crying this hard because it could have been over long before this point. The officer bags up the contents of the boxes and the flashes of cameras capture any traces of what had happened that afternoon. I give a short statement once I can speak coherently. They don't find Blueberry, but my father secures protective orders quickly with the connections he has. He looks so tired. It must have been so easy to protect me when I was small, when he could be the barrier between me and the monsters he dealt with on a daily basis. But that time has long since passed. All he could do now was make phone calls and pray to a god he did not believe in. He did not tell me about the journal left on the doorstep until years later.
The one that he didn't turn over to the police. The one that had photos of me sleeping. Photos of me naked and fresh out of the shower. Even some of me kissing my ex-boyfriend. Adam's face in these were scratched out and left hollow. All of them taken at times when I had assumed I was alone. I arranged to stay the night with Carly. She tells me the next morning that I'd started screaming in my sleep and did not stop until she crawled into the bed with me and wrapped me in her tiny arms. I'm grateful to her. I think her touch is what kept me from remembering any nightmares I had that night. It felt so good to just sleep. We moved soon afterwards, my father and I. We spoke of the incident only once more when I walked into the kitchen of the new house and saw my father at the table with a tumbler of bourbon in hand, flipping through a mound of papers with the other. They were the letters from Blueberry. He had retrieved them after evidence processed them. He intended to put them in his safety deposit box. I'll never forget the grim reasoning behind his voice as the lawyer in him spoke. Well, if you ever turn up murdered, at least I'll have this and that fucking journal to prove exactly who did it. I haven't seen or heard of Blueberry since that day. It's been five years, and it's taken two weeks of writing to get all of this out. There's so much to this story, and it's so harrowing, yet it's relieving to be able to put this all down together in chronological order, and know that I lived through it. Thanks. I needed this. My story begins summer of 2012. The first encounter happens before I'm leaving to go out of town for a summer study program. At the time, my mom didn't have AC, which meant we would leave the front door open as we watched TV before bed. Not smart, but the breeze was nice and we were naive. My friend was over as she was coming to drop me off and we fell asleep with the door open. We both woke up and discussed how we had weird dreams of a large man walking through the house. That's all we remember. Next thing you know, my friend is missing cash and cigarettes. Now, no one in the house smokes, and we destroyed the house searching for both cash and cigarettes. We were terrified to tell my mom that we forgot to shut the door, and my mom felt awful that my friend's cash went missing, so she replaced it, and we just forgot about it. I returned from the program about two months later. I was in my room. It was around 2 a.m., and my mom habitually fell asleep on the living room floor after working a long shift. I was texting a friend about a fight I was having with my boyfriend at the time, and then I hear something odd. My mom has jingles on the back door at this time because my sister and I at the time would sneak out, and it's how she would catch us. I listen to the jingle start shaking, and I realize that the back door is opening and closing. I start to freeze and text my friend. I think someone just walked into my house. Now, my mom's house is a ranch in a suburb. Small, cozy house, and you learn everyone's footsteps. My mom's are light, quick, and shuffled. The person walking through my house from the back door has heavy steps and they're trying to be quiet. I hear them open, look through a drawer, and scatter metal in the kitchen. I worry and think to myself, did they just try to search for a knife? I don't have the courage to scream or face the culprit. I text my friend to call 911 immediately. She thinks I'm teasing or being dramatic. I stop texting and listen to the person go into my sister's room. I can see from my window they had flicked on her lights for what felt like forever. Thankfully, she was at her friend's having a sleepover. I began to worry that they were going to open my door and come into my room. They didn't. This whole time, my heart is racing and I'm frozen. They walk over to the living room where my mom is still asleep on the floor, and from what I remember, I think they just watched her. Eventually, they left. 
I immediately call my mom, who was feet away from me, and ask if she was just walking around. She says, What? I immediately start to have a panic attack, scream for her to run to my room, and frantically explain what happened. Finally, the police department call me because my friend did call them, and they asked if everything was okay. I shout on the phone what happened, and they sent over some police officers. The police did a search around my house and saw footprints in the mud, right outside my bedroom window. They asked if my mom, sister, and I had partners or exes that may want to stalk us. We all hadn't at the time. I did admit to what happened two months prior, and it could have been the same person preying on us. We were all so freaked out about the incident, but it doesn't end there. Months later, my mom again has fallen asleep with the TV on in the living room. By now, we have a paranoid system of making sure the doors and windows are locked. We have thick window curtains too, but sometimes with the sun setting, you forget to put them down. My mom is half awake watching TV when she noticed a reflection in the window. She stares at it and thinks it's the TV glare when it waves at her. All of a sudden, I hear her screaming and stomping out the door. You fucks. Fuck you. I chase after her. She's out the door, chasing a giant white van. The culprit got away. My mom chased them. I had to yell at my mom it was probably not the smartest to number one, not call the police immediately. Number two, open the door to them. And number three, chase after them without any protection. Because who knows? But luckily they left her alone. We never found out who it was, and since then we've never had another incident. That we know of, at least. But whenever I visit home, there's always an eerie, unspoken paranoia. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story of your own to share and you would like me to feature it on the channel, please send it to the email in the description. Or if you prefer, head over to my subreddit, r slash stories from Mr. Revenant. It's the stories that keep the channel going. Thank you all for listening. And thank you to my channel members and patrons. Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're all doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.